This video was made in support from the beautiful people on my Patreon page. More information about my Patreon later in this video. Hello, all you beautiful people. I'm Ms. Sally Pride. That's with three Z's and Y, because why not? And in this video, we're going to be talking about how to fight transphobia using Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. To be clear, we're talking about the book, The Goblet of Fire, this time. Although I will make references to the movie. Specifically, we're going to be talking about society. If you haven't seen the previous three videos in this series, I recommend doing so as I'm building on information that I've already established in those videos. And yes, there's a playlist that should be appearing somewhere on screen. But before we actually delve into the Goblet of Fire, let's lay down what transphobia is. Because when talking about transphobia, I think a lot of people get confused. Now, when most people think of transphobia, they think of this. What's in your path? <gasps> Tell me, what's in your path? I need to know. A lot of people think it's an individualistic issue, like you might be a racist person. But, much like racism, transphobia is ingrained in society. There are barriers within society itself. Now, we can finally delve into Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Harry wakes up from a nightmare. And he's really confused about what was going on there. There's no time for that. He's got to leave the Dursleys. And now the Dursleys, they're not happy with Harry. And they set up literal barriers to prevent him from leaving. Now, society will often put up barriers for queer people, especially for trans people, that many of us don't know who we are. And our history is hidden from us. If you've seen the second part of the series where I talked about trans history, this is part of that discussion. And in summary, one of the reasons many people don't know trans history is because, well, a lot of us were in hiding. Or if our history ever was told, it wasn't written down. So that's why a lot of the stuff in regards to trans history is rather recent. It's not that trans people didn't exist beforehand. The reason there isn't much recorded trans history is because, well, we were in hiding. And if we ever got any sort of documentation on us, it would likely be destroyed upon our death. And even when our existence is known to us, there are still other barriers put in place. For example, a lot of times, transphobes will bring up an argument, which is to say, being trans is akin to blackface. And this is wrong. If you look at history, blackface was created to mock black people. However, trans people are just who we are and we live our life that way. Yes, I'm in drag. But in my daily life, I'm not doing this big exaggeration of womanhood. The thing is here, not only are we say we are, because I'm a trans woman and therefore I'm a woman, but when you look at the history of even like cross-dressing, there is overlap with trans people there. In fact, the word transvestite actually has closer origins to transgender than it does cross-dressing. Transvestite cards were given out for people who had gender dysphoria as a way to live their life authentically to treat their gender dysphoria. So literally, the treatment for gender dysphoria for over a hundred years, medically, has been to transition. <laughs> who would have thought? So we meet Ron's older brothers, Charlie, Bill, and Percy. Charlie trains dragons. Bill works in Gringotts in Egypt, and Percy works for the Ministry of Magic. These are all very noble jobs to have in the magical world, especially since none of them know math. Although, for Bill, that seems like kind of important if you're working at Gringotts. Magical people had to go in hiding, like for example with the Salem Witch Trials, is an example of how magical people are feared by the Muggle society. All of them have to dress up in Muggle clothing, and they go to a porky. They transport themselves that way. And the porky is sort of like a teleportation thing. Then we're introduced to Cedric Diggory. However, since he's not in Gryffindor or Slytherin, no one's ever heard of him up till now. Damn you, Gryffindors! And they're going to see the Quidditch World Cup. And like the movie, this is not relevant here. <laughs> so I'm just gonna skip it. Although what is relevant here is they meet a house elf named Winky. So as they're celebrating the end of the game, and relaxing, the dark mark appears in the sky. This is akin to a swastika, in at least our real world analogy. This is a symbol of hate and of violence. Later in the book, they reveal that Winky was the one who cast the Death Eater show up. 
and they are really the equivalent of Nazis in this world. This is a very clear, hateful attack. That's very clear, and it's very akin to how we in society as trans people are often treated. We are attacked for who we are, and well, this can often be violent, as was the example with the shooting in Colorado. Trans people and drag queens were the targets of it. Presenting yourself in a way that doesn't match up with your sex assigned at birth is scary to a lot of people. And even in the book, this happens. There is a wizard there who, his idea of muggle clothing was buying a dress from a muggle shop, and he wore that to the event. This was played as a joke. When people think cross-dressing is a joke, the inherent punchline they're drawing from that is that, oh look, it's a man dressed like a woman. Aren't men great? So it's silly that a man would want to be like a woman, because there's nothing about women that's desirable, because women have no desirable qualities whatsoever. A lot of the attacks towards trans women are due to the fact that we are perceived as men by these people, and we decide to become women, at least according to them. And something in their brain just isn't working. Like, why would we give up this male privilege? Why? Well, it's to be a happier. For us, this is what makes us happy. This is who we are and who we're always meant to be. And when you go after trans women like this, you are inherently saying something is wrong about being a woman. No one in their right minds would want to be a woman. That's what you're saying. And through all this, uh, one of the Orr's Mad-Eye Moody, he gets some help from, from Arthur Weasley, Ron's father, with a muggle cop. Because remember, when you're marginalized, you gotta stick together. Okay, so we should really talk about Spew. I'm thinking of just sort of like putting it together as one section. So Spew is a group Hermione sets up to help with the enslavement of house elves. Honestly, this is one of the worst elements of the book. Because... They're slaves, but they're often treated as though they want to be slaves and they're happy to be slaves which is a very racist idea. And even if you could find a case of a slave being happy, that's often because, well, what other life do they know? When you tell people that's all they can be, well, that puts you in a difficult situation, doesn't it? But in a lot of ways, this also has an analogy to gender as well. And the reason for that is... Well, oftentimes we play the role, even though we are obligated to do that, because a lot of us don't know there's a better life for us. You don't have to stick what your sex is assigned at birth. If you feel like your sex is assigned at birth is wrong, and you're a different gender or not a gender at all, that's fine. You're valid. And if you don't fit in the gender binary, that's valid too. So now let's talk about mad -Eye Moody as a professor. He turns Malfoy into a ferret and indoctrinates the children. Okay, so that was a joke there. He talked to them about the three unforgivable curses. Crucio, Imperius, and Avara Kedavra, the death curse. And he talks about them needing to be prepared. Because, well, this is stuff they're going to have to deal with. And a lot of them have trauma with this. So, like, Harry obviously has trauma because his parents were killed using Avara Kedavra. But Neville also has some trauma with this as well. Neville Longbottom, he has some trauma with this due to the fact that his parents were tortured. Neville's parents were tortured using the Cruciatus Curse. So there is trauma there too. He is preparing them for a world they already live in. So people claim this sort of stuff is indoctrination. But it's not. Kids are already exposed to this sort of stuff. That's why teaching stuff like LGBTQ plus equality is important. Because they're already exposed to LGBTQ plus people. Many of them are LGBTQ plus and know that. So then it becomes a matter of, are you going to teach them to accept themselves or teach them to hate themselves? Because remember, the opposite of pride is shame. And Harry shows a good initiative here. So Harry shows he's actually quite resistant to the Imperious Curse. And this is important because 
there are many factors that hold us back in society, but being resistant to them can make you a good fighter. And that's why Harry's a good fighter. Not only that, but he also has a strong set of morals and a strong backbone, at least metaphorically. I really hope his back is strong physically, though. So the Triwizard Tournament, it's like magical Hunger Games. They get a bunch of schools to come together and you're selected. However, this time they set the age limit to 17. However, as they later learn, someone can submit your name on your behalf, even if they don't have permission. And it's very clear in the text that the Triwizard Tournament is supposed to symbolize all these magical schools coming together and having a communal event. Which, again, is an element of how sports are popular in society. I'm not going to delve too deeply into the sports issue here, but it is important to remember that. Just remember, they're part of society, and when you limit trans people's efforts in sports, you are inherently limiting them in society. But I think there's a bigger point to be made here. These are death games. These are deadly games. So the question is, why the hell are they doing it? And to be fair, in the text, that's a good question to ask. But metaphorically, it's also a good way of saying, look, the world is a f***ed up place, and you need to be prepared for it. When you're magical, especially like for many of them, like Harry, who ends up becoming an Auror, you're in a dangerous line of work, and you need to be prepared. Also, ABA, right? It also makes sense under this lens why people are put in even without their permission. Or below the egg. He's 14 in this, but yet he's put into this situation without his consent. Trans kids are subject to transphobia. It's not just adults. So when you take away these kids' health care and stuff like that, that's literal transphobia. And there's also Rita Skeeter, the reporter. And she has this very interesting obsession with Harry and bends the truth of what he says. And this is often true of trans people, especially trans kids. The intentions are often warped to be some sort of like perverted thing. But in reality, what's really going on is just kids wanting to be happy. Trans adults? Adults just wanting to be happy. Trans kids? Kids who just want to be happy. And yes, I'm pulling up the statistic again. That when you allow kids to socially transition, you have a 72% reduction in suicidal ideation. That's huge. Transitioning saves lives. It's important to remember that. Oh yeah, Sirius Black, Harry's godfather who he hasn't seen in a while. Turns out he says, gives Harry a reminder through the fireplace. Just, you know, be careful. Because these are death matches for children. And the first match has to do with dragons and stuff like that. It really doesn't matter. What's important to bring up here is that Harry wins an egg for winning that part of the championship. And then it'll, like, help him somewhere down the road. I'm going to also skip over Christmas and the Yule Ball because, well, I don't really have anything to say about them. Frankly, I think it was very odd the movie went in that direction. Although I don't blame them for skipping out the spew part because, frankly, that, that part is just ugly. Hey, hey could, could, could we talk? Oh, it's you. I, I just want to say, I'm sorry, and I think I'm trans. She, her, by the way. That's a very nice transformation, and you got a nice skirt. Well, I was advised by three ghosts of gender, past, present, and future. I excuse me? Yeah, I know, right? You can watch it on Patreon for as low as three dollars! And you can even watch an extended, uncensored cut of the same video here! It's incredible! And not only that, you can watch Pride and Joy, a trans story. It really helped me along with my journey in discovering myself. Not only that, your financial support would really help me out. Because these videos are super expensive to make. So, go on and check it out. But hey, if you can't do that, at least give this video a like and subscribe. That's not a bad idea. I can understand that, but you've still done some damage. So Harry goes to the girls' bathroom with the egg. And honestly, isn't that one of the most trans things ever? What's an egg? An egg is a trans person who doesn't know they're trans yet. So, me, an hour ago. So, sorry, I gotta go for plot reasons. Okay, be careful. And then Harry starts having dreams about Voldemort. And Dumbledore tells him, don't worry, this is normal. And wow, those words are more true than ever. And there's a lot of truth in what Dumbledore says, because, well, 
Our anxieties are often based on reality. Frankly, I don't have much to say about the other challenges as well, so I'm just going to talk about what happens near the end of the third challenge. So Harry and Cedric are about to tie, about to touch the trophy, and it turns out it's a porky, and it takes him to a graveyard, and Peter Pettigrew is there, and then he kills Cedric Diggory, and Voldemort has come back, and there's a brief duel there between Harry and Voldemort, and when their wands intercept, Harry is saved by the power of love. That's the power of love. The sound of your heart beating, making it clear, the feeling I have can't go on. It's light years away. Turns out Barney Crouch Jr. was mad Eye Moody and Paul Juice Potion all this time. Hermione gets revenge on Rita Skeeter, and Harry gets his winnings from the Triwizard Tournament and gives his winnings off to Fred and George. Now, here's a segment I like to call Sally's Controversial Opinion. The movie did it better with the ending. Harry giving the winnings to Fred and George was a very good ending. And that could have been included in the film, and that would have been a great moment. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Dumbledore's speech, where he talks about how Cedric Diggory was murdered in very clear terms. He's speaking out and doing the right thing, even though it will hurt him in the end. Genocide is happening to trans people right now. In some parts of the United States, we're in stage eight. And around the world, it's all over the place. Our rights are being taken away. We are not being allowed to live who we are. We're not being allowed to be who we are. And before you start thinking, well, that's bullshit. No, when you start going after kids and you start taking kids away from their families for being who they are, when you tell kids they can't be on hormones that save their lives, when you make it difficult for adults to get their hormones, you are making it sure that we die. That is the intent behind these bills, plain and simple. These are genocidal bills, plain and simple. Genocide is happening but what will be done about it? I feel like we're in a similar time to what's going on now with a lot of stuff here. It's becoming harder and harder to be trans in life. And I think Voldemort's return is a good analogy for setting that up. Because he symbolizes pure hatred. Hatred was always there, but when he came back, the hatred was there even stronger than it already was and people feel like they have permission to act on it. And that's what we're going through in society. When people like J.K. Rowling talk about her beliefs, it tells people it's okay to think this way. It's okay to act this way. Even though she may not be endorsing violence directly, there are people who have these beliefs who are prone to violence who will act on them. When these laws go after trans people and target us in a genocidal way, what the f***? When these, these genocidal laws go after us, what the f*** do you think is going to happen? In Florida, there was some new anti-trans legislation, and what did they do after it was passed? They f danced. They f danced. The Democrats who voted against the bill even joined them. What the f***? These are not a difference of opinion. This is who we are as people. Would you say this would be a difference of opinion if someone want to eradicate all the Jewish people. So Voldemort's back. However, was he really ever gone? His allies and supporters were still around, sharing his beliefs. His return symbolized the start of the Second Wizarding War. And in our real world, many people like to call the fight for trans rights a culture war. This is not just a cultural war. This is an actual war. Our rights are being taken away. Our lives are being threatened. Genocide is actually happening. It's more than just a culture war. And that's why we need to fight back. For legal purposes, I do not condone violence. I'm talking about peaceful protests. Next time, we're going to be talking about allies and safe spaces and what you can do to push trans rights forward. Thank you for watching. Bye. No, no, please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me.